for all who are able, please stand for the opening song and the call to worship.
the Lord. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. For you, O Lord, are our strength and our blessed Redeemer. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray when they ask him, Master, teach us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our trust. Le lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say unto you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. Children are the buds of society. Children are an inheritance from the Lord. They are gifts from God. Without children, the family line is threatened with extinction. Children are the building blocks of society. Children bring forth new vitality into the community. Children are signs of hope. And with children come an awesome responsibility. You who are gathered here together in worship today are privileged to witness the coming of these parents and godparents to dedicate their children to the tender care and keeping of God our Father and to love into the love of the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. In so coming, these parents and godparents also stand here to rededicate themselves as they promise to maintain a Christian home, a home where the Lord Jesus Christ will be honored and where the word of God will be held in reverence. These parents and indeed all of you who are gathered here in worship today should be encouraged by new life and by the promise of a new life given through children because in the midst of their struggle to bring forth life, an entire community is being born again. The coming forth of life is a sign that God is still in the midst of God's people, wherever they are and under every kind of circumstance. Even in the midst of our struggles as African Americans, God is with us. His name is Emmanuel, and each child is a sign of God's presence in our midst. And to you parents who come bringing their children as it is fitting into the house of the Lord to offer him or her before God in this service of worship, we pray along with you that your God's richest blessings will be with your children as they journey through life in the midst of a world that has little regard for human life. You have shown by your presence here that you are a life-affirming people. Moreover, your presence here shows that you recognize the importance of seeking favor from God and from the people of God at this early point in the life of your children. We therefore pray with you that God is God's blessing will rest on you as with deep humility and a focused mind as you seek to train and educate your child so that he or she shall grow even as the Lord Jesus himself grew in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and humankind. 
Now recognizing the dignity and responsibility of parenthood and God parenthood, and recognizing your dependence upon God's help for strength and wisdom to faithfully discharge the duties of parents and godparents, do you now present your child and godchild in dedication to God, seeking divine blessings and guidance for his or her life? If so, answer, we do. Is it true that by your presence here at this altar and beneath the cross of Christ, that you are expressing a desire to share in the responsibility of the spiritual and physical in the intellectual growth of this child? If so, answer, it is. Amen. Having given this de decision prayerful consideration, do you now in the presence of these witnesses gathered in worship today solemnly promise that by your example and by your teachings and by using the many agencies of God's church that you will train your child and God child in love toward God or his or her family and others in the spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. If so, answer, we do. And now having presented your ch children and godchildren in dedication to God, do you also desire to re-consecrate yourselves to Christ? If so, answer, we do. In the spirit of this new commitment of re-consecration, do you promise that you will live lives that sit an example for your children and godchildren, relying upon God's grace to show the life of Christ in your daily lives? If so, answer, we do. Having heard these vows and sacred assurances as ministers of the gospel, we joyously and with earnest prayer commend your children and to the gracious keeping of God as we extend our circle of love to incorporate this new life as a gathered people of God. Your children and Godchildren will not remember this day, but we encourage you to begin today to tell him or her of the commitment that you have made, of the rededication of your lives that you have made, of the importance of the African-American community in the church which the Lord Jesus Christ gave his life for, in the prayers said on his or her behalf this day. Name your child. Maverick. Michael Luke. Harmon. Maverick, Michael, Luke, Harmon. We dedicate you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let the church say amen. Amen. Sasha. Elizabeth. Stinson. Stinson. Sasha Elizabeth Stinson. We dedicate you now in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. In the church said amen. amen. Tamira. Love. Nicholson. Kamara Love Nicholson. We dedicate you now in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, 
in the name of the Holy Spirit. And the church said, amen. Will all extended family please stand along with parents and godparents and repeat this prayer after me. Dear God, I thank you for this gift of this child to raise, this life to share, this mind to help mold, this body to nurture, and this spirit to enrich. Let me never betray this child's trust. Dampen this child's hope or discourage this child's dreams. Help me, dear God, to help this precious child become all you mean this child to be. Let your grace and love fall on this child like gentle breeze. And give this child inner strength and peace. And patience for the journey ahead. Let the entire village say amen. amen. Are there gifts to be given? The circular shape of this wristlet suggests content continuity and infinity. It represents the sacred link, the sasa, which means the present, with the zamani, which is the past. This wristlet is an ever constant reminder to this child and that he or she is a descendant of people who have a rich spiritual and cultural heritage. We did not begin in slavery. We began on the shores of Africa. We began at the beginning of time. We began when civilization first dawned and God breathed into the nostrils of humankind, God's own breath. And we became living souls. The wristlet shows our connectedness to the past and our hope for God's future in keeping with the customs of our African ancestors of seeking God's blessings on the new life that God has given in a service of worship and praise. We give this child pepper that he or she might develop self-discipline and a strong will. We now give this child water which symbolizes our wish for the child that he or she has purity of body, mind, and spirit. We now offer this child salt, which is the ancient sign that he or she might be endowed with wisdom and sound judgment. We now give this child vinegar, that he or she might prepare himself or herself to meet and surmount the trials and difficulties of this earthly life. We now let this child taste honey because life is more than pepper and water. Life is more than salt and vinegar. Honey is an indicator that we wish him or her happiness and prosperity. Honey is sweet and honey is a foretaste of what life in Christ can and will be if the child accepts what it is Christ offers. Finally, we anoint his or her head with oil as a sign that with this child comes hope. Our hope is in God, and our hope is in this child might become a visionary person among our people leading us ever nearer to our goals of spiritual and social liberation. Behold, the only one who is greater than thyself.
we thank and praise God for those beautiful babies. As they are a reminder, as Minister Phyllis just read, that they are a reminder that God has not given up on us and that there is still hope for us in our community and for generations to come. It's at this time where we take the time to welcome those persons who might be visiting Trendy for the first time. If you're here at Trendy for the first time, we invite you to stand all over the sanctuary so we might greet you in Trinity fashion. Come on, let's greet them and let them know that we thank and praise God. On behalf of our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, we welcome you here to Trinity United Church of Christ, if you can remain standing, the church that we believe is the greatest church this side of the Jordan. We thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be here with us. If you're visiting from another church, we invite you to take back to your pastor our regards and let them know that we thank and praise God for them and their ministry. If you're not visiting from another church and you're looking for a church home, we believe Trinity is a great place. And so after you hear the two preachers' words today, we invite you to give the, give the ministers your hand and give the Lord your heart. At this time, we invite Trinity members who are sitting around you to greet all of our guests and let them know that we thank and praise God. Encourage them, give them a fist bump, welcome them to Trinity United Church of Christ. Amen. Let us praise God for our guest. We also have with us viewing online, we have Janeth Barnes from Minnesota, Sharon Webb Abrams from Birmingham, Cheryl Elaine from Atlanta, Susan Fowler from Kansas, we also have Patricia Kelly from San Diego. We have Brenda Wilson Sampson from Hawaii. Mama O from Amherst, Massachusetts. Jeanette from Huffman, Texas. Doris from Doris Merrill Jones from Roselle, New Jersey. And Cynthia Elliott from Cape Coral, Florida. We welcome all of our online virtual members who are streaming with us today. We can praise God for them as well. I just have one quick announcement before we move to our offering video as well to our Trinity News uh, that is not in our Trinity News today. The, as you know, the women's retreat is um, coming very soon in about three weeks. Yes, that's right. We're excited about our women's retreat. But today we are excited because we have some fun things that happen and one of them is a pajama party for our women and what happens at the pajama party stays at our pajama party. See, they know. But we're gonna, we're gonna give you a little secret today that at our pajama party, we're having a lip sync contest this year. And so Sister Carol Jacobs will be in the back and they will be registering anyone from the women's retreat who is interested in being a part of this lip sync contest. And so we ask that you would make your way back to the narthex, I mean to the atrium, to sign up for the lip sync contest uh, for our women's retreat. I might sign up for that, that lip sync contest. Watch out now. Um, but that's all my announcements today. At this time, it is offering time. Scripture says, given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and running over shall the Lord give in to your bosom. God loves cheerful givers. Has God done anything for you, Trinity? Has God blessed you at all? We should be just as excited about offering time as we are about when the choir is singing, when the preacher is doing call to worship. As God gives us so many blessings, God gives us 100%, and God just asks for us to give a portion of what God has given us with our hearts toward God. Let us lift our offerings toward the Lord today as we prepare to go to the Lord in prayer for our tithes and offerings as well as our second offering today, which is for our facilities. And now, God, we thank you for another opportunity to give back to you a portion of what you have given to us. 
Bless now these gifts. Bless those who have to give and bless those who do not have to give. And allow these gifts to be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For 62 years, we, the Village of Trinity United Church of Christ, have been serving Jesus Christ, our liberating Savior, who has called us to be unapologetic of our relationship with God and unashamed of our culture as we prophetically stand with those who have their backs against the wall. Today, we have two offerings, with our first being our tithes and offering. Our second offering is for our facilities, which house ministry and the great work that flows out of Trinity United Church of Christ. Your giving toward our four facilities will help ensure that we continue to provide healthy environments for us to pour into and transform the lives of children, families, and the community. Scripture reminds us to give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and rolling over shall the Lord give unto you. There are multiple ways for you to support the powerful ministry of Trinity with your tithes and offerings. You may give through our Secure Give application. Text to give by dialing 855-781-8384 or use our cash app, dollar sign, Trinity UCC. You can also use our website, www.trinitychicago.org. And with a few easy clicks, you can support this ministry. Also, our First Fruits Direct Draft Program allows you to make your church a priority. If you prefer to mail your gift, simply send your tithe or gift to 400 West 95th Street. Thank you for your radical generosity in support of Trinity United Church of Christ, the greatest church this side of the Jordan. I'm Jada McIntosh, and you're watching Trinity News Live. Here at Trinity, we develop and curate lively ministries to further serve and work for our Lord and Savior. Take these next few minutes to listen in on the upcoming events within the Trinity community. Here at Trinity, we believe that your body is a temple and your health is well. For this third Sunday in April, we are highlighting National Infertility Awareness Week. This year's theme is Leave Your Mark. It's important that we advocate year-round for a patient's right to infertility care and a provider's right to practice. In light of the Alabama Supreme Court's LePage v. Mobile Clinic Incorporation decision, your voice is especially important this week, and we need you to be loud. The World Health Organization estimates that roughly one in six people worldwide are affected by infertility. Black women and couples struggle at two times the rate of their white counterparts. They are less likely to seek care and oftentimes are older. Infertility is a public health issue and affects many. Here's what you can do to take action. One, share your experience with infertility. Two, tag and write your elected officials and post about infertility on your social media platforms. Three, educate yourself and support those struggling with infertility. For more information about fertility and reproductive health, Check out Fertility for Color Girls and the guys at fertilityforcolorgirls.org, as well as the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Save the date on Friday, April 26 at 6.30 p.m. for Trinity's annual drug and alcohol recovery revival. Reverend Dr. Charlie Dates, senior pastor of Salem Baptist Church, will be the guest preacher. He was moved with compassion. He felt it on the inside. I'm so glad that I serve a God where even if you can't feel what I'm going through, He knows. This is Logan Page reporting the Trinity Health and Wellness segment. Remember your health is wealth. Trinity United Church of Christ is always in the heart of the community, ever seeking to win the community's heart. Happy Sunday, Trinity family. And if no one has told you, you are awesome, you are enough, and you are loved. All right, y'all, let's go ahead and get right into it. So we are calling all young adults, yes, all the young adults ages 19 to 35, please join the young adult ministry, the YAM, okay, for the finale session of It's a Real Partner, exploring the power of relationship series. Now y'all, this is the finale, so we need you to come out on Tuesday, April 23rd, from 6 p.m. to 7.15, where you wanna be in room 202. Now, sisters, divas, queens, who are in person or online, let me hear you say it's time. Yes, that is right. It is time for you to come on this journey with us for the Trinity United Church of Christ Women's Retreat. Now, let me tell you something. This is a revolutionary moment for you. 
for your self-care, for womanhood, and for sisterhood. Now, we got the dopest queens from across the country pulling up, like Reverend Dr. Janae Pitts Murdoch. Because information ain't the same as faith. Faith makes doors when there are no doors, and faith makes ways when there are no... Reverend Shalita Fomby. Everybody will encounter a moment in time, a season, a circumstance, and a situation in life when your faith has to fight to stay in the light. And Dr. Maria Bouquet. We actually become genetically different because our genes are actually representing a stressed body. Now all of this greatness is happening May 16th through the 18th, 2024, in Lake Geneva. Now, you already know registration is $150 per person. Hotel info can be found in the bulletin. And if you are interested in being a vendor, which we want you to be, go ahead, contact Women's Retreat at trinitychicago.org. All right, y'all, it's coming back. So go ahead and mark those calendars for the Trinity's Women's Guild and the Young Adults Ministry Tech Savvy Seniors Workshop Part 2 on Saturday, April 27, 2024 from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. in Montgomery Hall. Now, these are all the things that you can expect to experience. So you're going to learn how to navigate all of these fancy devices because I'll be seeing some of y'all, you know, but it's okay. We got you. You're also going to learn how to avoid these common scammers because we don't play about our seniors. And lastly, how to stay safe online and safeguard your personal information because that's your business. Did you know that in this city, one in four African-American women are victims of violent crime? Chicago, it's time to talk. Join CBS Chicago at Trinity United Church of Christ for a moment of hope on Thursday, April 25th at 9.30 a.m. for an impactful conversational event focused on advocating for justice for Black women. That's right, I said justice for Black women. This will be moderated by CBS Chicago investigative reporter Dorothy Tucker. All attendees must register in advance, and for more information on how to register and about the program, see our bulletin. This is Marlisa Stalling reporting our community engagement segment. Recuerda eres las manos y los pies de Cristo. And remember that you are the hands and feet of Christ. Trinity family, did you know Midweek Manor is back in person here in the sanctuary? The call goes out for each and every one of us to let some stuff go. Come join us Wednesdays live at 1130 a.m. for a powerful word and worship. We hope to see you there. Save the date for the ordination of Michelle Day and Victor Parrott on Sunday, April 28th, 2024 at 1.30 p.m. Stop by the table in the narthex and learn how you can be a part of Trinity's First Fruit Stewardship Program. It's scholarship time. If you are a Trinity member, you can apply for scholarships and graduate recognition. The deadline for applying for a scholarship is Thursday, May 9th. For more info, visit our website at www.trinitychicago.org or check out the bulletin. Finally, remember to watch Trinity United Church of Christ on the Fox Soul Network, Sundays at 9 a.m. Central. And be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook. I am Jada McIntosh, and this is your Trinity News for April 21st. Stay tuned for upcoming events and stories involving the Trinity community. Remember to stay blessed and live out loud for Christ. Thank you for watching. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. To my Trinity family, I want to share with you that on today, I am in Washington, D.C. at the magnificent Howard University. Some people call it the Mecca of Black education and excellence. I will be meeting with our students and representing Trinity on the HBCU Day at Howard University. And I look forward to every Trinity student showing up at chapel and for our lunch after chapel. But there is something special that I need to share with you. As I've shared before about the Department of Planning and the Chicago Department of Transportation known as CDOT, they are planning a meeting April 24th at 6 p.m. 
a virtual meeting to talk about 95th Street. I want to let you know, I have met with the Commissioner of the Department of Planning. I have met with Commissioner of CDOT, the Chicago Department of Transportation, and they have assured me that the viaduct will not be on the agenda for this coming meeting. Because of your vigilance and concern, they heard us loud and clear before we even completely organized our movement to share our vision for 95th Street. So what I am asking for the entire village of Trinity to do is this. Sign up for the virtual meeting April 24th at 6 p.m. Immediately following the worship service, there is a table where you can receive more information. There is also a QR code where you can receive information about the April 24th, 6 p.m. meeting from the Department of Planning of the City of Chicago. I have to let you know how proud I am to serve as pastor of the greatest church this side of the Jordan. As soon as we announce the concerns in our community, you started moving in the direction of saying, we have to change this. The city received calls, emails, letters. You talked to mama and them and all your cousins and let them know we do not want a viaduct. This is not over, however. We must stay vigilant because we have been dealing with the possibility of a viaduct since the Emanuel administration. So we need you in the meeting on the 24th at 6 p.m. And this is all we ask that you do in that meeting. One, let it be known that you are part of Trinity United Church of Christ in the chat, or you are a resident in Washington Heights, or you are a person who is concerned about the development in, on the 95th Street corridor. Keep it positive, just share, you are part of this village or community. And we will be partnering with the Department of Planning and CDOT. We'll be walking with them in reference to their plans. And if anything shifts, I guarantee you, you will hear directly from me in terms of how we need to function and operate as a community. But let me say it again, I am absolutely elated and proud to be the pastor of the greatest church this side of the Jordan. Don't mess with Trinity. Our folks know how to get on the phone, know how to organize. They start an email campaign, even in the book club or block club they're a part of. I thank you for your work and for your witness. I look forward to seeing you when I return. As a matter of fact, as you are listening to this right now, I probably finished preaching and I'm sitting down with our students as this video is being played. That we continue our series of generosity. Today, I'm partnering with our preachers today in a unique way for our sermonic presentation. And next week, I have a message God placed on my heart entitled Liberation Economics, the power of generosity and liberation economics. And 95th Street will be a part of liberation economics and the power of generosity. We don't want gentrification. We want renaissance. We want a bustling, thriving, flourishing community where our children may grow up and witness the beauty and power of excellence in their community. Thank you again. I cannot say enough how proud I am to be the pastor of the greatest church this side of the Jordan, known as Trinity United Church of Christ.
giving, no matter how hard you try. We thank and praise God for the ministry of the Sanctuary Choir. Amen. Amen. For how they blessed us on today. At this time, we ask that you would prepare your hearts as we receive our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, who has prepared a mighty word for us. Let us receive our senior pastor. To my Trinity family at this moment, let us prepare our hearts and minds for prayer. I'm grateful for my preaching partners on this day and that I might pass the baton after a short examination of the word that we will be looking at on this day. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and see if there is any destructive way in me. I ask, O God, that you remove what does not belong and cast it into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Holy Spirit, do thy will, do thy will, Holy Spirit, in the mighty, magnificent, awesome, majestic, powerful name of Jesus we pray, and the people of God who love God may say, Amen. I want to invite us to take a look at the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 21. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 21. And as the music plays behind us ever so gently, let us look what the scripture states. Beginning with verse 1 in chapter 21. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. I'd like to place a tag here for this moment as the music comes down uh, to deal with the power of generosity. Uh, part three, generosity over visibility generosity over visibility. What I love about Jesus is the radical nature of Jesus. What I love about the Bible is the word is subversive. It moves beyond our expectations. A radical savior and a subversive word. If you commit to studying and reading the Bible. Every time you, you think you know what you are reading, a new expectation and revelation begins to blossom. If you commit to following Jesus, I'm telling you, when you follow Jesus, Jesus will always push you out of your comfort zone. He'll force you to look in the mirror instead of staring at what is wrong with other people. Jesus will call you to self-examination and to examine how we live our life so that we can be in alignment with God, a radical savior and a subversive word. 
The word is subversive and our savior is radical. So here we have Jesus. If I may paint this picture standing at a distance, I can imagine him after he has finished the teaching He now observes those who are going into the synagogue, those who are making the claim that I I serve God. I'm a good good Jew. I'm I'm one of the holy church folk. I, I can imagine that he is looking at those from a distance. And as he is examining people going in and coming out, he notices that there is a group A group of men were bringing their their money, their their wealth, uh, their resources to the temple. Then there is a sister. I I don't know her name, who is also bringing what she has. The scripture says Jesus notices that the rich are bringing something. But then a poor widow. The rich are putting in their gifts. And a widow is putting in all she had. But, but look at the juxtaposition. Hmm. He says the rich are bringing their gifts and a poor widow. What, what normally happens within Scripture that people usually have a name. If you are wealthy, it d- indicates that you should be someone who has a name and you know their father's name. Like the sons of Zebedee. Or the name of an individual. All the disciples have a name. But Jesus is saying, look, look at the, 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 the rich people being defined by what they are doing. And then look at this poor widow. A terminology that helps us understand who this person is. A poor widow. Let me help you out right here. A poor widow, uh, that a person who was a widow, they were defined by who they were married to. We don't even know her name. We just know her condition is poor, and she is now a widow. She is no longer married because her husband has died. Can you imagine when your identity is wrapped and connected to somebody else. Folk don't even know your name. You're just a poor widow. And women during this time period were were marginalized. But to be a widow, when your entire identity is defined by who you are married to, and when that person dies, there is no insurance policy for you. The money would go to the eldest son, which raises the question, where's her children? She's a poor widow, but but she's still on her way to worship. I I don't know. I I don't know. I can use my sanctified imagination that maybe, possibly, it could be uh, that she was going to worship because she had been going to worship all these years, but she's now a poor widow. If there's anyone that doesn't need to be going to worship, it's this poor woman, but she chooses to go because this is part of her commitment. She is considered to be invisible in society. A poor widow. You don't know her name, don't know anything about her character, but you know her condition. And there's a problem when we focus on people's condition and don't ever look at their character. There's this poor widow. But standing at a distance is Jesus. Jesus sees the rich people. But his eye falls on the poor widow. Mm. The juxtaposition of what is happening. And it has the nerve to say to the disciples, I want you to know who gave the most. The one who has the greatest generosity is not the wealthy. But the one with the greatest generosity is the poor woman. The widow, the one who doesn't have a name, who was, uh, her identity was attached to the person she used to be married to, but who is now gone and has transitioned across the Jordan. The one who gave the most is the widow. She gave out of her poverty, 
not out of her wealth. She took a risk of generosity. And then the result of that risk of generosity, she increases her visibility. She moves from an invisible woman to a visible woman in the eyes of Jesus. I'm giving everything that I have because God has kept me all these years. I believe that she is coming back uh, to the synagogue because she knows that Yahweh, that Elohim, that Jehovah has been walking with her in spite of the fact that she is poor, in spite of the fact that she has lost her husband, in spite that she has no identity uh, without her husband in the eyes of other people. She knows that she is seen by God and we witness in this text that this woman is seen by by Jesus. Mm. But yet, the rich think that they're giving a lot. But the ones who are truly giving, the one who is truly giving, is the one of deep generosity. She is willing to sacrifice, to take a risk, And there's something about her virtue, her character, her spirit. She doesn't give based on, let me see what I have. She just says, this is who I am. I am a giver. I'm generous in how I function and how I live. And I can imagine in this moment, maybe Jesus is looking at this woman and thinking, hmm, She's giving everything that she has. And Jesus knowing in the back of his mind that he is going to have to give everything that he has for the people that he loves. This woman is giving everything she has. And when the question becomes, when was the last time we were like this sister, this poor widow, when we gave deeply out of generosity? I'm not just talking about physical. I'm talking that her spirit was generous. This is who she was. This was her character and her virtue. The act of generosity gave her visibility, but she wasn't seeking visibility. She was still operating out of her vulnerability that gave her visibility because of her generosity. See, she was the wealthy one in the text. The rich were the poor. Uh, But those who were rich thought they were wealthy, but they were really poor because they never gave out of generosity. They were giving to be seen. Because the question is, how did they know that they were rich? Based on dress and who they hung out with. Uh, Maybe they came with a little bit of arrogance and pomp and circumstance that they were coming to bring what they had. But here is this woman quietly moving up what she does every single Sabbath. No one around her, just doing her thing. And she caught the eye of Jesus. Mm. This principle of giving. What happens when we give like the widow? And what happens when we give like the rich? The widow gives out of the depth of her spirit and her soul. The ones who are lifted up as rich in the text are just giving out of convenience, going through the motion. They are, there is no sacrifice. They are, uh, they are not pushing past. They, they are doing it so other people can see them. But it's not just what they physically give. Many times we go through the motions when it comes to worship. We give half-heartedly with our song. We give half-heartedly with our prayers. We give half-heartedly with our service. We give half-heartedly with our worship. We're just there to be seen. It is part of a pattern because our mothers brought us here. Our, Our spouses demand that we come here. There is no connection whatsoever, and therefore we are not catching the eye of God. 
But this woman says, I will give all that I have. Out of the depth of her poverty, she was still deeply committed uh, to her relationship she had with God and the obligations that she was given. Because here was the thing. She was poor, but she was giving to the synagogue. The synagogue had an obligation to assist those who were poor. She's thinking, I give to the synagogue. That's my responsibility. But there are people who got it worse than me. And I want to bless somebody else. I'm not going to tell the rabbi what the rabbi needs to do. I'm not going to tell the the committee what they need to do. I I just know that there's some people, even though I struggle, I know there's some people who are worse off than me. And so I'm going to do something to bless somebody else. They will never know my name. But I want to be a part of allowing someone to thrive and to flourish. I dare us this day that we have a spirit like this woman. I call her Sister Winnie, the spirit like Sister Winnie. I don't need visibility. I don't need anybody to know. I just want to bless somebody in the process. When I come into church, I'm going to give everything that I have. I'm going to give my praise, my joy, uh, my self-reflection, the grace and the love that God has given me because it's coming out of the abundance of my character and who I am. Let us give everything that we have. Give all of yourself. Sing with authority. Pray with power. Worship uh, with strength. And meditate with deep reflection. Walk from this church with a generous spirit and a generous heart and give and give and spread beauty for all of the ashes that we see in our community. Let it come from your heart and come from your soul. Generosity visibility. This generosity elevates this system. And may generosity elevate you to a deeper relationship with our God. And we continue to meet Jesus in Luke chapter 20, preaching and teaching about generosity with power in the temple courtyard, not too long after being confronted by some angry, hating religious leaders who wanted to seize and murder him, all because his claims challenged their authority. Nevertheless, Unafraid and unbothered by their threats, Jesus did not allow these religious leaders, they allowed their insecurity to become his insecurity because he knew who he was and who he was in God. That is, Jesus did not allow his enemies to deter him from his divine destiny. And somebody in here needs to hear that today because, see, when you are about something and doing the Lord's business, people will have the tendency to hate on you because they ain't about nothing and have no business themselves. People that don't get hated on are people who don't do nothing or trying to be about nothing. But when you are about something like Jesus, you won't let no hateration cause you any frustration because you understand God has called you to a destination and God don't play about you. Tell your neighbor and let the haters keep on hating because my God who has called me to do something, he don't play about me. 
Jesus was being hated on by his enemies, but he did not let them stop him from doing what God had called him to do. He kept teaching and he kept preaching. And what's interesting about our text is that chapter 20, verse 45 through 47, right before our text that we, Pastor Moss just read, we see Jesus with his unashamedly bold and black Jewish self saying while all the people were listening in front of his haters, he puts the teachers of law on blast in front of everybody. Here in chapter 20, verse 45 through 47, he says, be aware of the teachers of the law who do things for men to see, like to be greeted in the marketplace as the great one. They love to sit on platforms, but they devour or take advantage of the widows and the most defenseless in our society. God's people, can I tell you today that one of the things that I love about Jesus is that he doesn't have problem calling a spade a spade or putting folks with corrupt character on notice, especially if they are not doing God's people right. And the truth be told, like Jesus, I can think of a few elected officials and hope to be elected folks that we need to put on notice and let them know that we're not going to tolerate any of their shenanigans any longer. We need to be telling every congressperson, senator, and even Supreme Court that they need to stop trying to control women's bodies and reproductive rights because women have a right to make decisions about their own bodies. We need to demand that, pe that they stand stand up to ensure that everyone, regardless of ethnicity and socioeconomic status, has the right and access to vote. And we need to raise complete hell that they hold the Bible and gold sneaker selling chump accountable for invoking an insurrection by a pro-Trump mob of his supporters to attack the Capitol to overturn an election. Sometimes, God's people, you have to put folks on blast about their racism, their misogyny, their white supremacy, for justice to roll down like a mighty river. Jesus put the teachers of law on blast in chapter 20, and then in Luke 21, verse 1, we find Jesus and his posse sitting in the courtyard near the temple treasury. The temple treasury, God's people, in Greek, the, which, which was Gazephalakon, was the place where worshipers were required by the Torah to, br to bring their valuables and treasures to the Lord. The treasury of the temple was made of multiple boxes scattered about and was called the court of women. Now, each box was fairly large, and it was capped with metal funnels to ensure that large gifts, gifts would, could be deposited and the sound would be amplified when the offerings were dropped. And it was here in verse 1 that we find Jesus. He looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury and a poor widow who put two very small coins in. Widows, my brothers and sisters, were considered some of the most vulnerable and de dependent of society because of their inability pro to provide for themselves, particularly with them being women. And although they were to be protected by the law, sometimes the people of the law oppressed them and mistreated them because the systems were corrupt. And understanding this system and seeing both the rich and this widow give their offering with this, Jesus says, truly, I say to you, don't get it twisted. This poor widow has put more in than all the others. There are several things today that the Savior wants to ensure that we don't get twisted when we see this widow and the rich putting in their offering. First, because I don't have much time. First, the text teaches us, don't get it twisted because the Savior sees you. Somebody say, the Savior sees you. Verse 1 says that he saw the rich putting in their gifts, and he sees this poor widow putting in two small coins. The big gifts were certainly seen and heard uh, that the wealthy gave. Ma matter of fact, when they deposited their, their gifts, it was a tradition for everyone to applaud when they heard all of these, cute, these coins make a huge noise. Unlike this widow, when she gave her, her, gave her humble gift, 
People or onlookers would probably ignore, ignore her. But the text lets us know that in spite of the onlookers who probably ignored her or didn't notice what she put in, Jesus sees her. I love that. May I please help somebody here? I don't care how many people are here at Trinity right now. Jesus sees. While other folks, folks might be looking over you, past you, not speaking to you, the Savior notices you and is looking right at you and knows exactly what you need and even what you are going through. He sees your circumstances. He sees that you pressed your way to worship in spite of what you're going through. Jesus sees you. Somebody say, Jesus sees me. Can I get about five folks in the sanctuary who can thank God for a Savior that sees us today? Can you thank God that the Savior sees you? He don't see how much money you got. He don't see what your clothes have on. Jesus sees you. Don't get it twisted. The Savior sees you. But secondly, the text teaches us to not get it twisted because the Savior has something to say about your sacrifice. Notice Jesus doesn't say anything in verse 1 or 2, but he doesn't say anything until he gets to verse 3. Jesus says truly in verse 3, I tell you that this poor widow has put more in than all the others. There is something about this poor widow and her offering and her sacrifice that moves the Savior to speak and challenges our thinking about giving. Jesus speaks up about her sacrifice, and she doesn't even know that he's doing it. Notice there's no conversation that's going on between Jesus and her. She is putting money in the treasury. He's in the courtyard watching everything, and that's a powerful word for somebody in here right now. Somebody is speaking a word on your behalf in rooms that you have no idea about. Somebody is praying for you. Somebody is calling on the name of the Lord for you in rooms and in spaces that you have no idea about. Jesus spoke up about her sacrifice. And I believe that Jesus did because he understood that the wealthy, again, gave out of their abundance, meaning that they had more when they left to live on. But this woman, she gave out of her poverty or sacrifice all that she had. This word sacrifice in gr Greek means to come closer, which means she showed up, uh, she showed up uh, with her presence and, and, and her sacrifice. Her, when she showed up, her presence and her sacrifice was simply saying this, that she was seeking to come closer to the Lord. She was not giving for show, but this woman generously gave from her heart because she wanted to be close to the one who had kept her and provided for her through it all. See, the true purpose of one who makes a sacrifice or gives generously is that they want to be close to the Lord. See, the size of a gift doesn't even matter to God, but it's the heart behind it that matters. Let me ask you a question today on this Sunday. Is that which we give, do we give it to the Lord because we want to be seen or because we want something from the Lord? Or do we do it because we want to draw near to the Lord? Do we come to church or give time in our ministry and study the word or give of our tithes because we want the Lord simply to bless us? Or do we do it because we simply want to be nearer and closer to God? For in as much as God desires that we give, God wants our hearts and all of us more. God wants us to be close to the Lord. Don't get it twisted, my brothers and sisters. The Savior sees you. Don't get it twisted. The Savior has something to say about your sacrifice. But don't get it twisted. The Savior also will set the story straight. I have to be honest with you all today. I, I wrestled all week with this passage because I knew that in as much as Jesus was seeking to help us to understand 
uh, about what generosity is and what true sacrifice is, Jesus in our scripture, this is not a pretty text. Jesus in this scripture is also trying to deconstruct a system that has sought to coerce people in giving, that has sought to oppress people in giving. And he's also seeking to expose those people who have taken advantage of the vulnerable. Oftentimes, this particular text has been used by scholars and preachers alike uh, and has been twisted to force people to give. But this text, and to use this woman also as a model of giving, but giving to her death rather than to her abundance. But this text, I tell you I struggled. I struggled till I walked in this, uh, walked in this church today. I struggled because it's a tough text. Because all my life I've heard that we've got to give our last mites, even if it kills us. Because the truth of the matter is, is if you look at this text, we have no idea what happened to this woman after she leaves the temple. It's real talk, y'all. She gave all she had. And it's very likely that she got what she had because she had to beg for it. She gave all she had. And she didn't even know where she was going to get her next meal from. She gave all she had. And didn't know how she was going to pay her rent. She gave everything. When the wealthy gave out of their abundance and still had something to live on. Think about it. But Jesus commends her. And he lifts her up. And he says to every woman, everyone in the space, that all of these people, they, these other people, they gave out of their wealth. They got something. She gave out of her poverty. She put in all she had. Jesus was letting us know that this sister's faith allowed her to show up and give her all. She gave her last money because she knew that after all she had been through, even after losing her husband, even after probably having no children, because if she had children, and particularly a boy child, she would not be in the situation that she was in. After all she had been through, the Lord had still kept her. God has still provided her for her. And she didn't care how much it cost because she knew that the same God that had kept her since her husband had died, the same God that had provided for her, the same God that kept on keeping her was going to do it again. And so she gave generously. She gave all that she had. And like this woman, God is calling for us to give the totality of ourselves and to trust that God is going to take care of our every need. To trust that we may not always be able to see the hand of God, but we can trust the heart of God. This passage and words of Jesus also challenges us today 
to not only be generous with our time, our talent, and our tithe, and to trust that God is going to provide, but to, be, but to also to open our eyes to the needs of others around us by being the hands and the feet of Christ in the world. Don't get it twisted. We too live in a world that seeks to oppress rather than uplift. But if we trust God and give God our all, there are places where people are hurting that you can heal. There are places of hopelessness where you can bring hope. There are places of lifelessness that you can speak a kind word. There are people without food that you can provide food to eat. There are places that people need our support. We can give our all. Can I tell you today, I know somebody else that gave their all. Scripture tells us that he walked the dusty roads of Palestine some 2,000 years ago. He gave his all, as Pastor Moss said, to all of those that he loved. So much that he gave his all in death. Because scripture tells us that he would not come down from the cross just to save himself because he wanted to save you and me. And so he decided to die just to save you and me. And the story goes on that he was buried and death thought that it had the victory. And the enemy thought that they had the victory, that they were through with this revolutionary prophet. But scripture tells us that one early, one Sabbath morning, that Jesus got up and said, don't get it twisted. I got all power in my hands. And because I've got all power, you've got power to give it all. Is there anybody in here today who's willing to give it all? Matter of fact, let me ask you a question. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. I'm wondering, is there about 20 folks in here who are willing to give your all for Christ? Who's willing as we leave this place? I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about your all. Are you willing to use your hands and your feet for Christ? Are you willing to be God's trombones? Are you willing to give your all, to be generous with yourself, to be a blessing for others and impact this world? The doors of the church are open. Is there one today, some man, some woman, some boy, or some girl? Is there one? We invite you to stand all over the sanctuary if you're able, as this is a very sacred time where we invite people to bring their whole self to the Lord. Is there one? Come on, let's praise God for this young brother that is coming. Come on, encourage our young brother.
Is there another? Let's welcome Jamori. Come on, let's praise God for our little brother. Jamori, we welcome you to Trinity. All the applause that you're hearing and the people that you are seeing stand behind you. These, this is your new family. All new aunties and uncles and grandparents. And this is your village. And we thank and praise God for you becoming a member of Trinity United Church of Christ as we all extend our hands to you. And we say welcome, welcome to Trinity, Trinity. The, greatest the greatest church, this side of the Jordan. Of the Jordan. Let's praise God for him. Yeah. Jamori's parents can come with our membership clerks and Minister Dr. Sue as they are making their way upstairs to the library. Let's praise God for our little brother. You all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As our media ministry is bringing up our prayer notes, our bereavement notes, we ask that you would keep all of these families in your prayers this week for the family of Vanessa Jackson sister of our member Deacon Deborah Higgins for the family of June Moon, friend of Trinity United Church of Christ and cousin of our member, the late Amy Moon, for the family of Marie Ross, grandmother of our member Tiffany Box McHaskell, for the family of Alberta Wilmington, mother of our member Michelle Diff Dickerson. We ask that you would keep each and every one of those families in your prayers that God will comfort them and keep them. At this time, we are preparing for our altar call. We ask that you will pause where you are and that you will center yourself as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. God, we're reminded that the songwriter says, just a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He will hear your faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. Just a little talk with Jesus will make it all right. And Lord, we come this morning to talk to you. But first, before we talk, we just want to worship you for who you are. For God, you are sovereign. You are amazing. And you are altogether lovely, and for this we give you praise. God, we are so grateful to be in the house of the Lord one more time and even to be able to witness the worship service during stream. We recognize, oh God, that somebody didn't make it from last Sunday to today. But God, because of your grace, you allowed us to have a marvelous Monday. You kept us and allowed us to have a terrific Tuesday and a wonderful Wednesday. You allowed us, oh God, to have a, to thrive on Thursday. You allowed us, oh God, to have a fantastic Friday. And you also allowed us, oh God, to have a day full of surprises of your love on Saturday. And to make it back in worship one more time. And for this, we say thank you. God, we thank you for waking us up this morning and starting us on our way. We thank you, O oh God, for the food in our pantry. We thank you, O oh God, for the blood that's running warm through our veins. We thank you, 
O oh God, that we are in our right mind. We thank you, God, for the capacity to be able to move our limbs. God, if we had 10,000 tongues, we'd never be able to thank you enough for all that you have done. And so, God, right now, we want to have good manners and say thank you. And God, I thank you for all those who are gathered here and who are watching right now. We thank you for their lives because each one of their lives, oh God, represent a miracle. They are a very miracle that they are alive in your presence in worship today. So many things could have and should have took them out, but by God's grace, they are still here. And for this, I say thank you for their lives. And God, so many people, some come today with no prayer concerns, but there are some who come today with heavy hearts. And God, it is my prayer that you would touch right now. For those who are in need of healing, God, we ask for healing. For those, oh God, who are in need, who are in need that, you, that you answer prayers, God, we ask that you would answer their prayers. For those who need a financial blessing, God, it is my prayer that you would open up the windows of heaven and uh, that they will not have room enough to receive. God, for those who are in need of a home, we ask, oh God, that you would open doors. For those who are looking for jobs, we ask, oh God, that you would move them toward the assignment that you have for them. God, for those whose marriage and relationships are struggling God we ask for amending and for reconciliation for those whose children are struggling we ask that you would wrap them in covering God whatever it is that they need today God we ask that you would meet them right now at their point of need that God that you would turn some stuff around in their lives that you would shift their lives that you would give victory that you would break every chain God do it right now for God we need you and we can't get along without you. And so today, in the name of Jesus, we come declaring and decreeing, oh God, that you are going to make some ways out of no way. That God, that you're about to make some crooked ways straight. That God, that you're about to answer some prayers. That God, that you're about to restore some hope. That God, that you're about to give some victory. That God, that you are about to show up and show out and while you're showing up and showing out right now god we give you premature praise we're not gonna wait till any battles are over because god we know that you're going to provide we know that you're going to make a way we know that you're breaking chains we know oh god that you're sowing seeds we know that you've showed up right now we bless you right now we bless you for the victory we bless you for the blessing we bless you for the miracle. We bless you, oh God, for meeting your people at their point of need. We thank you, God. We glorify your name as we offer this prayer in your precious son, Jesus' name. And we all say together, amen, amen, and amen. Come on and give God praise. If you believe that God is answering your prayer, come on, you gotta believe it. You gotta worship it. You gotta bless God. Give him some praise. Praise him right now in advance. He's working it out. Right now. Hallelujah. Now as we go, out with a spirit of peace and seeking to give our all, we now say may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be ever so gracious to each one of you all. Until we meet again, go in peace, go in peace, go in peace. As we all say together, amen, amen, and ashe. Have a fantastic week, Trinitarians.